So hi everybody, this is Hasahab. I'm Giacomo and today I'm with uh, Mohammed Ali. He's a CFA chartered. He runs Purity Macro. You can find him on Substack and on X. So Mohammed, please introduce yourself and then we'll get into the content of today. So macro analysis and we'll see what we can expect going forward. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Giacomo. Um, yeah, I spent uh, uh, most of my life as a trader um, in London and in Toronto. I, I was working for uh, TD Bank uh, my entire career. Uh, my final role, I was global head of all currency trading. And uh, I traded uh, fixed income and FX uh, products, which are really uh, macro uh, products. Uh, you can express your macroeconomic view uh, through those instruments uh, the best. Um, and uh, yeah, I did that for two decades. I, I had a macroeconomics undergrad. I, I did my CFA um, and spent 20 years uh, uh, at the bank and then parted ways uh, from institutional trading a couple of years ago and now launched this uh, passion project uh, which is, as you uh, mentioned earlier, called uh, Purity Macro. And here I, I really get a chance to just express um, my macro insights and analysis and really just leverage my, you know, 20 plus years uh, trading markets. And hopefully uh, uh, that is of some benefit to uh, people. Great. So, um, you know, this is, I, I, in Purity Macro, I, I put out a weekend piece called The Big Picture. Um, and so that's the title for this presentation. We try to step back uh, a little bit and get into it. So The Big Picture, you know, uh, by Purity Macro, uh, what's been happening? Well, inflation has been coming off. And of course, we'll, we'll discuss why I think that actually might be uh, reversing, uh, but it has been coming off. And uh, as a result, the Fed has been able to signal easier monetary policy, okay, which has uh, put downward pressure on long-term interest rates and mortgage rates and really helped uh, the equity market higher, um, among other factors. Um, the U.S. consumer has been buoyant, and we'll discuss why uh, as we get into the presentation. Uh, the Chinese uh, authorities are now actively trying to stimulate their economy. Uh, their equity markets have just been uh, in the doldrums. Confidence has been in the doldrums. Uh, they've actually been in deflation, you know. Um, but it looks like they're starting to wake up and stimulate so we'll we'll discuss how that uh, can impact uh, the inflation outlook uh, going forward, and of course uh, the AI boom, and uh, no conversation on global markets these days can happen without discussing what's going on in in this area. So uh, you know I'll spend a couple minutes <clears throat> in my presentation on what that means for how we look at the world at uh, a purity macro. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get into the, uh, the slides. I'll try to be as um, clear and, and simple as possible. Uh, you know, part of purity macro's intention is to really demystify uh, the global macro economy. Sometimes it can seem a bit complicated and it is a complex uh, world at the moment, but my intention is to try to demystify it. So let's see if we can uh, uh, humbly do that here today for your um, for your followers. Um, so here, as I said uh, right off the bat, inflation has been coming off. Okay, we can see this very, very clearly. This is a chart of um, the PCE price measure in the U.S. Okay. Um, it's an indicator that the Fed watches very closely, okay? We can see the post-COVID <laughs> spike up uh, to uh, almost 7%. And of course, uh, 
you know, central banks tightened policy into this rise. And, um, you know, most central banks target is around here, right? 2%. So, you know, we're getting there uh, slowly 2.6% uh, on the main PCE uh, number at the moment. So what this has allowed the Fed to do is to, to start signaling to markets that, hey, guys, you know, uh, victory on inflation is, uh, is near. So we might be able to cut interest rates, okay? And uh, maybe stop selling bonds, which they call QT, you know, or quantitative tightening, which is the more um, complicated term for it. Uh, but really it's just, they're just selling 10-year treasury and mortgage-backed bonds. So they've signaled um, some easier monetary policy and uh, of course, that has you know put downward pressure on interest rates and eased what we call financial conditions, okay, uh, which has helped uh, the U.S. economy, and we can discuss that a little bit further as well. But while uh, inflation uh, has been coming down, and the Fed has been signaling uh, potential easier monetary policy, there's a another very important dynamic that's happening and that is labor productivity okay we can quite clearly see that it's been on the rise okay and labor productivity it doesn't need to be complicated it is what the word says it is the productivity of the average worker okay in a certain day how much output can that worker produce and what was that relative to the previous quarter okay and of course as we enhance our technology knowledge base and some of these ai generated use cases are boosting labor productivity um this is showing up in the numbers okay um so labor productivity is is on the rise. Now, what this actually means is if your worker is now being able to produce more, well, you might pay him more, you know? And we can see that actually wages in the US have also been rising at four to five percent, roughly at the same pace as productivity. So now we have this upward pressure in wages. Okay, as inflation is coming down. Okay, and the Fed is saying, hey guys, guess what? Your wages are going up because you're more productive, and we might also be cutting interest rates for you. So, wow, you know. And at the same time, if we look at the chart on the top left here, the US economy has been creating jobs. Okay, last two months, the US economy has produced 800,000 jobs. Okay, so just get your head around that, mostly in the service sector. Okay, so productivity is rising, wages are going up. The Fed is saying, hey, we might cut interest rates, and the labor market is strong. So guess what's happened? Consumer sentiment, look at this, spiking, okay? The U.S. consumer is feeling good, okay? And we there, it's no mystery why, okay? And we can really see, especially in the fourth quarter of last year, on this chart, this real sort of spike in consumer sentiment. And this is not only uh, showing up in, in how we feel, but they are voting now with their wallets, okay? So this is personal spending uh, from the PCE data. This is Q4 of last year. We can see clear momentum now building in personal spending as this U.S. consumer 
enjoys a higher wage and a declining inflation and uh, a strong labor market, okay? So all of these macroeconomic factors, which we've just uh, discussed, there is one chart in which they show themselves, and that is the S&P 500, okay? 23% rally since October of 2023. It's an equity boom, okay? I say it's a boom because, first of all, anytime an equity markets, uh, an equity market rallies almost 25%, you know, it, it, it can be characterized as a boom. But this has happened fast, you know, just in October. And typically we see these sorts of rallies when the Fed is like cutting interest rates and, but there's no, we're not cutting interest rates. They just signaled, they just signaled that, hey, we may lower, you know, and bang, 23% up, okay? So there is no doubt that we are in a strong macroeconomic environment, okay? And the equity market has been um, clearly displaying this, okay? So what are the risks? Um, which is really what we and or me, I personally, you try to watch out for. Well, the risk is inflation, okay? Because all of this or a lot of this has been happening while inflation has been dropping, okay? But what if this were to start going back up, okay? And it might happen. So we're, we might all be familiar with what's going on in the Red Sea, okay? With the Houthi rebels and the uh, skirmishes and battles that are happening with the uh, US and UK uh, army. Um, that they intervened a few times. That's right. That's right. They've been intervening. And this is why they're intervening. They're intervening because look at what's happening to the cost of shipping. Okay. I mean, uh, this is the Drury uh, index. There are many uh, like this. Um, and we've got uh, different uh, routes here, you know, Shanghai to Rotterdam and Shanghai to New York, uh, but they've all skyrocketed, okay? Uh, about five or 600% in about 60 days, okay? And so that, that I think that, uh, I think the Panama Canal is having a hard time too with the, all the issues on the canal right now because of the droughts, right? Right, right. So, right. So, and, and I, uh, I'll be honest, I haven't um, looked into that much myself, but thanks for, for, for highlighting that. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, as Giacomo has mentioned, plus what's going on in, in the Suez Canal, uh, in these two canals, this, this is going to have an impact on global inflation because, you know, uh, a large percentage of global goods get transported through these canals. Energy, shoes, clothing, all this stuff. You know, if Walmart wants to import uh, some plastic toys from Shanghai, well, it's the, the shipping bill is now three to four times higher. Okay. So this takes time. Now, of course, since the interventions have been happening, we can see it's coming down, right? You know, but still, even at this juncture, it's about 300% up, okay? So one key risk for inflation, especially in the first quarter, is that some of this uh, extra shipping cost starts getting passed on to the consumer in Europe and in the US, and we see February and March inflation numbers start heading back up, okay? So that is uh, risk number one. Risk number two on the inflation front, gasoline. 
Okay. Now, gasoline actually, uh, you know, last year there was a lot of talk of oil going up and, and things like that. But actually, gasoline the whole time was coming down. Okay. Um, and we won't get into the technicalities of why the gasoline oil spread uh, was widening. That will be for perhaps another conversation. But the reality is gasoline was coming down and it was helping inflation down, okay? It's a significant uh, portion of people's monthly expenditure. But since the low in December, we've rallied 15% in gasoline, okay? So, you know, so shipping is going up, okay? Shipping cost is going up. Uh, gasoline prices are going up. So there are now two inflationary forces uh, potentially uh, coming into the pipeline. That's on the micro side of inflation. Now, on the macro side of inflation, here I have, and I apologize for this chart being a little bit uh, more uh, busy than the other ones, but uh, uh, here I've charted the Chinese stock market in blue, and the U.S. S&P 500 in uh, black, okay? And we've got China is stimulating. We, we discussed that uh, earlier. Um, so, you know, Chinese stocks have been rising uh, quite sharply the last two weeks. And China has been in deflation. But if China is now stimulating then maybe they'll come out of uh, deflation and we could start getting some inflationary impulse coming from China, you know. Um, at the same time, as the shipping stuff is going up and and gasoline is, is rising. So on the macro front, China stimulating their economy is, is inflationary. Okay? No doubt about it. So what can all of this then lead to? So let's say that the stock market continues to go up as it has been, you know, and China stimulates and is successful. And some of these micro factors actually cause inflation to go back up, maybe to three, three and a half percent, you know. Well, then the Fed... They can't uh, ease monetary policy as much as they would uh, like to. And that would cause the interest rates to start heading back up. This is the 10-year treasury yield, okay? Um, you can already see the market is sniffing it out a little bit. Uh, you know, the fixed income market is very good at that, okay? All of these things I'm discussing, they, they, they're sensing this. So we've already moved up 30, 40 basis points. Um, you know, now the 10-year yield is around 4.25, 4.3. But uh, this, this can continue uh, to 450, 475, you know. I mean, uh, if AI is going to uh, produce these new use cases, and we will be able to boost a potential GDP in the future permanently, well, then long-term interest rates will, will go higher. You know, that's just uh, macroeconomics, okay? Um, it's not trading. It's just a valuation of, uh, of a risk-free rate, you know? So if yields are pressured upward, to 450, 475, well then things like this can happen. So this is uh this is the chart you, you may know uh or may not know. This is a chart of NYCB, New York uh I think it's community bank. Community bank, right. a community bank, yeah. New York community bank. <laughs> it, it, it's uh, 
it dropped, uh, you know, almost 50%. Um, so they have a large um, commercial real estate and multifamily uh, portfolio. And they've been suffer suffering some loan losses and some defaults. So they reported like a, a quarterly loss a few weeks ago. And they've taken out some loan loss provisions uh, for the upcoming quarter. So they're anticipating <laughs> like a, a difficult environment. Okay, now this is a micro situation. It's it's very particular to the New York market and and Manhattan and the work from home and all of that. Okay, so so we don't want to blow things like this out of proportion. Okay, but I bring this up because as this equity market boom continues, technology led and interest rates go up and inflation potentially goes back up. Well, then areas in the market which are leveraged to higher interest rates, they will they will have these mini, mini uh, hiccups, okay? Uh, like we had in Silicon, the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, last year, SVB, you know, and now NYCB. Uh, Germany is also, uh, I believe, talking about issues in their commercial real estate uh, market. Okay, so, you know, these are, uh, as we experience this boom, this technology boom, this growth boom, um, you know, myself, uh, at Purity Macro, a lot of my time is spent on, you know, watching the market for these sorts of, of risks, okay, and um, highlighting them uh, to my viewership uh, and to my followers, okay, um, and uh, to that end, uh, what we also do is, we, you know, we, we try to keep a, a handle uh, on a weekly basis on you know, incoming data and 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 how it's impacting our view. So, um, you know, this particular week actually is is very important. The we spoke about inflation. Uh, so the PCE, you know, the chart that I put up in the beginning, the the latest figures for that uh, measure are due on Thursday. Okay, so we will get a real time read on what is happening to inflation as this year uh, gets going, okay? Um, and it's important because the March Fed meeting is actually just about two or three weeks away. So they're going to look at this number and um, then we will get a chance uh, to see what the Fed uh, has to say about all of the stuff we spoke about, inflation and the U.S. consumer and potential risks to prices and and what China is doing and 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 the tech boom, et cetera. So so the next two three weeks are are very key for us at Purity Macro and for the way uh, we look at things. Um, so we're you know we're going to be particularly focused uh, around uh, you know the lens. Uh, that we've discussed uh, here today. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a flavor uh, of, of the sorts of analysis uh, that we do. And, um, you know, that uh, brings me to the end uh, of, of the presentation. Um, if, you if, you found, uh, if you found it uh, inspiring or it set off uh, some light bulbs or you're you're curious or you want to learn more, uh, you know, please feel free to subscribe uh, to my newsletter uh, and podcasts. Okay, the, the content is free at the moment. Um, and uh, you can get that at puritymacro.substack.com. Okay, so you subscribe on as a, as a user and you'll get the, the two written emails and the podcast delivered right to your email on a weekly basis. And if you wanna hear what I have to say on a daily basis, uh, then you can uh, follow me on X, 
And my handle there is um, at Puri Mako. So it would be a pleasure uh, for you to to join my 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 uh, newsletter and podcast content, or to follow me on on X. So uh, perhaps I'll I'll leave it there and and hand it back to you, Giacomo. Okay. 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 Maybe I have a, a few questions regarding sure the stuff that you you have talked about. So you talked about you know. Uh, monetary policy, Fed policy, and Europe. Um, I wanted to, maybe it's just an opinion on why, for example, the ECB is slower, even though the economic results are much worse compared to the US. Is it yes. in some jokes online that uh, the ECB does nothing until the Fed does uh, start yeah. starting? But uh, from my point of view, probably it's, um, more because, um, of course, the EU is more exposed to the energy imports that it has from the Suez Canal, the Red Sea, and so on. So probably they're more cautious because of that. Do you see any other uh, explanation of why the ECB is slow, even though the, the economic results are worse compared to the US? Yes, it's a great, it's a great question. And uh, um, there are two reasons one you've highlighted already okay um that they, they are they are closer to the suez canal and so they're they're going to feel the heat uh, more in from the inflation standpoint but if uh, if you at a macro level okay there is a and it's very important for people to understand this there is a core difference between the ECB's mandate and the Fed's mandate, okay? Mandate meaning what the government has told them to do. Yeah, the 2%, right? Yes, ECB, and if you hear their speeches, they have a single mandate, just inflation. Their job is only to keep inflation at or near 2%, okay? On, for the Fed, if you go into the, the legal uh, uh, writings, okay, they have a dual mandate. The Fed has a mandate to maintain stable inflation. First of all, the 2% is something that the Fed has given, okay? But the Congress actually just told them to keep it stable, okay? And that is a different discussion. But their mandate is to keep inflation stable and to maximize employment. So growth, Fed is pro-growth because it's part of their job. So they will always be looking to cut rates quicker than the ECB. Because when they go to the when they testify to the Congress on a monthly basis or the Senate, they're, they get put under the fire. Like, why are you, why are you keeping interest rates so restrictive? You, you, you're, you're holding back the economy. So the ECB doesn't have to face this, okay? The ECB actually is, it's all about inflation. So that is why they're slower. That is why they're slower. Okay, okay, okay. And talking about, uh, you mentioned in the last part of the presentation, New York Community Bank. Um, what does that mean in, you know, the greater picture? We've seen, uh, I think it's been uh, in, in a year and a half, we've seen Silicon Valley Bank, we've seen First Republic, we've seen Credit Suisse, and now New York Community Bank facing some real difficulties. Is there something like a, a bigger picture that we need to understand? And another thing that is important from a macro perspective, given the fact that uh, you have some understanding of that, um, from what, I, what we've seen in the past, um, the institutional markets like the mortgage-backed securities markets can dry up very quickly. Do we see any signs of that, of stress in those markets or not? Yeah, so... Um, uh... Let's 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 talk about the um, the 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 individual uh, financial names, you know, like Credit Suisse and First Republic, and 
SVB. It seems to me here, I'll just give a view, okay? It doesn't look like it's a macro problem, okay? It, it, these situations, when you look at them closely, they, they seem like micro issues, okay? Specific to maybe some mismanagement uh, within those companies, or, or even if they managed well, like maybe NYCB managed fine, you know, it's just that post COVID, the the nature of the work from home uh, situation changed for Manhattan, you know, now they don't have control of that. Okay, uh, so you can't how much blame can you can you assign to management, you, you know, yes, um, sure. but yeah, sometimes real estate problems spill over into banking, right? Yes. So contagion. Yeah. Yeah. So so there, um, you see, uh, in the 08 crisis, okay, it's my perception, okay, uh, from what I can see and experience in markets, that really we have a lot less uh, derivatives trading now, uh, interbank. Uh, we have the, 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 the credit ratings for these uh, uh, securities and CLOs, they're more appropriate. So the amount of capital people have put aside, you know, they're, they're more in line with the risks that are inherent, okay? So it seems to me like, and, and the funding markets, like we, we, we all moved away from LIBOR and, and we're more on the overnight funding and, and the central banks are actually a much larger part of the global uh, funding uh, system uh, as compared to 08, like they're there. You know, as soon as there's even a little problem, like they just come in with all sorts of measures. So, so the piping is strong. Regulation has been put in. Um, so it, it 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 doesn't feel. It doesn't feel. I can't say for sure, but it doesn't feel like we have those sorts of risks. Okay, and of course, you know the risks are that everybody has these huge treasury portfolios, which are considered risk-free assets, okay? And that's what happened at SVB, you know? And interest rates are moving up and the value of these go down and you can say, well, it's risk-free, but is it really risk-free because, but yeah, the accounting yeah. allows, yeah, you know, accounting allows you to hold these to maturity. You don't have to declare the losses. Only if you have to sell in order to raise capital to cover depositors, which is what SVB had to do. So these are but that's a more management, a balance sheet management, a liquidity management issue at SVB. And can these factors become contagious? They can, but it's a lot harder given how we are set up from a regulatory perspective and from central bank piping. Um, so I, I keeping an eye, of course, I experienced all of this. And when I see stuff like this, it brings back memories. But then the equity market just continues to power higher and the issues are forgotten about in three or four weeks. So it, it leads me to believe that, you know what, maybe the system is, the system is strong as a result of those previous crises, you know, so. Okay, okay, okay. So I'm done with the question. Mohammed, I really wanna thank you for your time, taking the time and for this presentation that was very clear and very interesting. You highlighted a lot of interesting things that are happening around the world and how we can interpret them. So thank you for being with us and yeah, look forward to the next one. Yes, it's it's been my pleasure. Thank you for, for having me on. Okay, so this is it for today. I'm Giacomo. This is also Hub. See you next time.